Okay, here he talks about um, uh, here his uh, Huntington's notion of what identity is is that people define their identity by what they are not. So therefore, it is uh, uh, it is it is comparative. So that, uh, in some senses, he, he his proposition is that there is no identity. Okay, um, and therefore, the only identity that people have or define is uh, is how they compare themselves to to others and what they are not of others. So, uh, in some in some ways, this uh, the, uh, this is not necessarily orientalist, but it it could be used as part of a. Uh, a need to identify oneself based on what is, one is not of the other. Okay. Now, obviously, if if if, uh, if, if, there, are, if there are belief systems in, in a god and uh, and the creator, then the identity is also shaped with with the belief system. It is not uh, necessarily uh, shaped by the other, the what you are not of other human beings. So therefore, there's another aspect which shapes identity, as well as probably if there's an ideology or a philosophy of life that also can identify one's, in which one identifies oneself, whether others are like it or not is another thing. So this is a bit of a superficial kind of uh, uh, um, uh, articulation or definition of, of uh, identity, okay? Uh, but it's, it, it, uh, it is not uh, surprising because it comes from a settler colonial uh, uh, basis of identity making in which the settler colonial needs to shape their identity based on how they deal with the First Nations and how they uh, present themselves as the total opposite of First Nations or, primitive, or, or what they call primitive civilizations or primitive people. So therefore, Huntington being from the United States, he kind of uh, has this uh, ingrained in his uh, uh, in his approach to what identity is. Uh, so this is not necessarily necessarily what is. Uh, uh, this is not a definitive definition. It is his definition of what identity is. Okay. So I just wanted to point that out because it's interesting. It, it ties into settler colonial identity. It ties into uh, depending on the other to have an identity, and it excludes any other forms of identity shaping which have to be made perhaps with belief system, uh, relationship to God, or relationship to philosophies of life, or ideologies, or or, or other things. Okay. Um, I have unmuted you also if you want to if, uh, have anything to ask. Linton. Pardon? Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, so, good afternoon, Doctor. Uh, I have one question. Uh, once we come to the paper, we will uh, write down the points of uh, Hull. So once we mention the points of Hull before the analysis, do we need to define that to explain about that points or just we can mention it without uh, going in details to explain what that point's about okay before we before we go any f further into the text I, I, um, I, I would suggest that if you're doing the paper um, so that uh, it, uh, it is it is clear how you are uh, tackling the the question is that you you talk about the points of how uh, explain uh, maybe in one or two sentences three sentences what what each one is about and then you take uh, universal civilization point uh, point by point of how now the ones the points in how that are re relevant some points in how are not relevant okay so this would kind of you would take the you would uh, in the introduction uh, you would um, explain which points of Hull are relevant to uh, Huntington. Then you would uh, deal with universal civilization uh, uh, and break and uh, dissect it with uh, the points from Hull. 
but you also need to uh, show from the text where uh, where Hal's point uh, manifests or appears in the text. Okay, so you need to give me examples. You need to give me. You need to prove that, uh, or you need to give me evidence from Huntington that this is that uh, this is those points. You can also use the article, the first and second article, is the shraq will is the will will the two the two articles. Uh, you can also use them. Uh, but uh, and then after you've done, done each university civilization bro uh, an uh, analyzed it uh, through Hull's points, you provide a small conclusion about the university civilization. Then you go into the modernization. Again, then you say that you're going to analyze this through this, these points of Hull, from Hull. And then you begin with the first point uh, and second point, third point, fourth point. Now, now it need not necessarily be uh, the same points for universal civilization as modernization. They could be different. So, uh, but if they are the same, then, the, then they are the same. So then you see from the text regarding modernization, where he's uh, uh, implementing or kind of manifesting house points, you provide a conclusion about the uh, modernization. And then you add another section of analysis in which overall you analyze the universal civilization and modernization and how the both concepts in Huntington or present, as presented by Huntington are orientalist, but they also try to give an idea as to why you think he's being like this. What are his motives for being orientalist? Okay. And then in the conclusion, uh, you, uh, you have to, you try to, you have to remind the reader that you are answering the question, the, as the assignment question. Uh, uh, show how or explain how or is how Huntington is orientalist in his uh, uh, pro proposed uh, or in his uh, concepts of uh, universal civilization and modernization. And therefore, the conclusion, in addition to being the conclusion, conclusion of the paper, it should be should be provide your answer about uh, the assignment question based on the analysis before, not uh, as if it as if the conclusion has not has is separate from the previous uh, body of text. Again, as I explained in the email, what you have learned about Orientalism is 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 your background information from which to address uh, to deal with the assignment. What you have learned from Orientalism is not the assignment. Okay, the assignment is after what you have learned from Orientalism. How do you apply that skill and analysis of Orientalism into the, the assignment question? Okay. Any, any other questions? Or uh, doctor, still uh, one clarification I need. Yeah. Now, regarding the HAL points, do we need to explain what it's about? Like if we write a regime of truth, do we need to explain yes, what's the regime explain, of truth? Yeah, you need to explain what the regime of truth is. Uh, this is in the, uh, this is before we starting the analysis, yeah. Uh, a little, yes, yes. Just in a, in a in a small paragraph, you explain each one. Sure, thank you, doctor. But you also provide footnotes or sourcing of where you take it. Each after each quotation, if you are using quotes from Huntington or Hull or or any other quote, immediately after the quote, you need to put the citation. Even if you're taking uh, several quotes from the same page. You need to repeat. Uh, repeat. You cannot leave a citation, a quote, direct quote, without citation. Nice. Thank okay. you. Okay. If you're talking about points, general points in one page, in two, from three pages of maybe Huntington, then you can say, okay, these points are taken from Huntington, the date of the publication, and pages uh, so and so and so and so. Okay. But with direct quotes, you need to immediately after the direct quote, you need to put the, the citation of the source. All right. All right. Um, I hope Any? Yes. I was surprised from this thing that, that I have to mention in the introduction, um, Hall's point, because basically, um, why I have to waste the introduction mentioning and talking about it? I can talk about it through the the text. Okay, you can say that you can say that uh, if you want to uh, invest more space, more uh, space. In the text you can, but at least identify which of uh, Hull's points you are going to uh, 
uh, you are going to talk about. Okay. Uh, and uh, if you are before you go into the uh, the modernization, okay, it, it's up to you. It's up, depending on style. You can either talk about the points and explain them before you go into universal under the under the section of universal uh, or be, before no before uh, dealing with uh, after the introduction. You can talk about Hull's points if you want to uh, before you uh, address uh, universal civilization and modernization, or you can incorporate them in each point, in each of the concepts. That's a matter of style, which works for you better. Okay. Okay. But uh, but don't uh, just say that the regime of truth uh, is in Hull and then he, uh, Huntington is kind of promoting uh, uh, regime of truth and then that's it. No, you need to explain what uh, what Hull means by regime of truth. And then see whether Huntington fits into that uh, uh, description or analysis of the re regime of truth. If not, if there is no direct link, but you have the you have the overall picture idea that the, the regime of truth is there's, there's something of regime of truth in Huntington, but it's not apparent in the text. Then you then you can interpret that. Okay, but you need to show why your interpretation, why you are interpreting that. How what are you seeing in the text that the reader is not seeing? Okay. 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 Any other questions? Do not assume that the reader knows Hull, and do not assume that the reader knows Huntington. The re the reader is going to read uh, uh, fresh. Uh, so what what you what you write in the paper is what is uh, being read, and what you have. Put in the paper is being is being understood. If if there's a, if the, if you are writing and you assume that the, you've covered the basic uh, uh, scope but not specific, they know the burden of, of explanation and the burden of it is the responsibility of the writer to explain how things fit together, not to leave it to the reader to uh, uh, analyze and imagine the, the reading. Okay, the paper. Okay, so we go back to uh, now um, the Western modernization. So, which and he's still he is still building uh, still building on this universal civilization thing, but the more uh, the, the Western modernization and what we're focusing on is his idea of modern, modernization. But for him. Uh, mo modernization has more to do with the West than from the type. So the third, more, the third more, most general argument for the emergence of the universal civilization sees it as a result of the broad process of modernization that have been going on since the 18th century. Okay, uh, we're talking about 17, late 1700s, 1700s, 1800s. Uh, uh, modernization involves industrialization, urbanization. Um, increase uh, uh, it involves um, industrialization, urbanization, increased levels of literacy, education, wealth, social mobilization, and more complex diversive occupational structures. Uh, okay, so more complex and diversified occupational structures, which means that you become uh, the, the the types of jobs become more. Uh, uh, intricate and more uh, sophisticated it, it could be if you're in a bureaucratic system uh, the, the the specific job you do is very uh, could be very, could, uh, could mean that you need to analyze papers you need to analyze data and what and, what, and write reports so this is another form of, of uh, job skill which is not uh, relevant uh, which was not prevalent say uh, uh, in the in the political systems of the uh, medieval medieval time, uh, why it becomes more complex because you need to involve the people more. So therefore, uh, but what he's not talking about is making war. Okay, so Tilly he he kind of uh, brings in the modern state systems with with war making. Now Huntington is not uh, talking about war, but yet uh, the the title of his book is Clash of Civilization. So he's kind of saying that we need to, not, not, uh, to in some way, shape or form, for the West 
to maintain, uh, and particularly the United States, to maintain its dominance, it needs to be able to wage wars because it's dependent on economic, uh, on wars economically, and uh, where wars are done and maintain control over uh, uh, energy sources in other uh, of, the re of other countries and other regions, which supply the the global uh, uh, industrial uh, system. Uh, so this is this uh, implicitly he's, he's kind of using a Tillian version, but much less uh, clear. So it is a, we continue. It is a product of the tremendous expansion of scientific and engineering knowledge, beginning with 18th century, that it made possible for, for humans to control and shape the environment in totally unprecedented, unprecedented. So this is what this is the idea that man or human beings control the um, the environment, and the environment is there, and the nature is there to uh, like shift and primitive civilized. From, from primitive to civilized societies, that is the emergence of civilization in, a, in the singular, which began in the Valley of the Tigris and Euphrates, the Nile, and Indus, uh, about 5000 BC. So he's, he's saying that the uh, modernization is in itself a, process, a revolutionary process, process uh, uh, compared to the regime or, the, or the, what existed before. So when you talk about uh, modernization in Europe in the 1800s, you're talking about uh, the industrial revolution, the, the, the military revolution, the, the knowledge uh, uh, advances, and uh, the technological revolutions, and uh, all these things, and also the revolution in the political system, uh, from uh, absolute monarchies to uh, constitutional monarch monarchies, which included the the people so this required a, a new fo form of way of dealing with people uh including them in the um, in the body of the state rather than having them excluded and building new identity so therefore nationalism uh, in uh, in the tillian in, uh, uh, in uh, huntington's version is that uh, uh, the purpose of nationalism in europe was that you identified yourself by 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 showing that you're not if you're French you're not English you're not Belgian you're not Italian you're not Spanish if you're Spanish then you're not English you're not French and so that is how you uh, define all these things uh, together or how he would define them so. Um, When we go to, uh, so as the first civilization, uh, so his process of civilization is that as the first civilization modernized, the West leads in its acquisition of the culture of modern, modernity, as other societies acquire similar patterns of education, work, health, wealth, and class structure. The argument runs this modern Western culture will become the universal culture of the world. Okay, so he says that uh, in the, the what his civilization, the, according to Huntington, the only civilization that, that was able to modernize in recent time would be the would be the West, and therefore the, this produces a culture of modernity. Um, and uh, and what improved in the whole process are the education, the work, the health, uh, the class structure becomes less uh, uh, less apparent. Even though it remains, but it's less, uh, that's kind of uh, uh, striking uh, to some extent. The argument, and uh, then more than Western culture will become the universal culture of the world. This is a significant this, uh, that significant difference exists between modern and traditional cultures is beyond dispute. Okay, obviously, a world in which some societies are highly modern and others still traditional will be less homogeneous than, the, than a world in which all societies are comparable, comparable high levels of modernity. But what, but what about a world in which all societies are traditional? Uh, this world would uh, exist a few hundred years ago. Was it any 
that's homogeneous. Then a future world of universal modernity. So he asked some questions and he refers to China and uh, France, the Fifth Republic and Mao Zedong and how he uh, transformed China from, uh, from agrarian to industrial or agro-industrial. So modern societies could uh, could uh, resemble each other, but they need not be uh, identical. So and he points he gives several points about uh, resemblance resemblance of modern societies. First, the increased interaction among modern societies may not generate uh, common culture. Uh, so he is talking about uh, how why modern societies would resemble each other more than traditional societies. First, because uh, obviously, if you need to interaction interact with uh, each other on the same level, if modern and modern culture interact, then they are able to interact more efficiently and effectively. So the, this is one. Uh, second. Traditional societies was based on agricultural. Modern society is based on industry, which may evolve for, uh, from handicrafts to classical, classic heavy industrial knowledge based industry. So the uh, agrarian societies or, or, or uh, traditional societies would be uh, focusing on, on agriculture and small handicrafts. Uh, whereas uh, industrial uh, societies, modern, would depend on heavy industry and large, uh, uh, which rely on a lot of knowledge. For example, if you want to build large ships, you need to have engineers and, uh, and uh, physicists and all, all the various types of man managerial uh, capabilities of um, uh, producing uh, a ship after a long process, for example or patterns of agriculture and social structure, which those with them are much more dependent on the natural environment than the patterns of the industry. So the traditional society is more rely, relying, is relying more on the, what the nature has to offer in terms of uh, seasons, uh, rain, water, and then therefore uh, production, uh, agricultural production. But in industrial societies, you can make a, a factory in the desert and be productive. So uh, the, um, it is not as dependent on the environment as uh, the traditional place. So he's talking about rich soil and climate and conditions. Okay, modern societies thus have come, have much more in common. So therefore, if you want to be modern and part of the modern uh, society group, uh, you need to become uh, mo modern. Now, how do you become modern? Uh, what are the what are the kind of the, uh, stepping stones for be, uh, for achieving this modernity? So, th what are these distinguishing characteristics? Okay, he has um, he has pointed out uh, at least seven uh, items. Uh, Yes, seven items. Okay, the first one is classical legacy. legacy. The, the second one is uh, uh, is at the end of page sixty nine uh, or sixty or oh, is at seventy Catholicism and Protestant and Protestantism. Protestantism. The third is European language. Fourth is separation of spiritual and temporal authority. Five is the rule of law. Six is the social pluralism. The seven is representation, uh, representative bodies. And the eight, no, he has eight. Eight is individualism. Okay. So what it is for him, these are what uh, we need to be in the in, um, in the idea of or in the process. Uh, of or the components of uh, Western modern uh, or modernization point. So the classical legacy. So uh, which means that you need to go back to the Greek uh, thought, the Greek philosophy, Greek rational uh, thinking, uh, 
the sciences of the Greeks, the mathematics, and the, okay. So a third generation of civilization was, uh, the West inherited much from the previous civilizations, including most notably classical civilization. The legacies from, we uh, from West from classical civilization are many, including Greek philosophy and rationalism, Roman law, Latin, and Christianity. Islamic and Orthodox civilizations also inherited from the classical civilization, but nowhere the, uh, near the same degree as the West did. But this is kind of uh, a bit misleading. So the, his, his proposition here is that uh, the Western civilization went back to the classical. Yes, and he talks that, he says that the, 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 the Greek, the, the, the Greek uh, civilization, Roman uh, law, Latin, and Christianity benefited from the classical civilization. He admits that Islamic and Orthodox civilizations also inherited from classical civilization, but he doesn't say that how much uh, is Islam contributed, at least in the Middle Ages, how much Islamic uh, scholars contributed to transferring this classical civil, civil, civilization and, and uh, even uh, uh, new findings or discoveries in the Islamic period which affected the Western civilization, such as, for example, the algorithms and uh, the, the whole um, uh, numeric system of, uh, of the zero. The zero is, a, is an a Arab invention. For, uh, the, you, Ro the Romans used to count by one, two, three, four sh uh, lines and then uh, uh, and then you have D uh, alphabets in order to count the uh, uh, numbers. So the, the zero is, a, is an art invention. Or, uh, and it, it helps uh, 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 calculate the large uh, numbers uh, by, by adding the zero to the one, one. So it became 10 and 100, 10, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, and so on. Okay, uh, and uh, so the Jaber is, uh, is an Arabic uh, uh, invention, which the, which now what happened was that after the demise of the of the of the Andalus, uh, Andalusia, uh, they had many translators who, who came to the to Spain at the time, Al Andalus, and to learn from the, the classical language and to translate and to learn and to translate the text into uh, uh, languages which the Europeans could uh, uh, could understand. So therefore, there was a lot, lot, lot of knowledge transfer from the Muslim period to the uh, to the European uh, to Europe, which is not credit given credit enough credit. Okay. So just to say that the, uh, the Muslims were consumers of the classical uh, knowledge is a bit is a bit of an understatement. They actually kind of advanced uh, much of the classical knowledge. Okay, and uh, the also the, the um, understanding the coordinates of the of of uh, of the. Of the of the stars in the sky, so that when you when you are in, at sea, you can determine your position and navigate by the by the positions of the stars. Okay, so in that sense, uh, you that's also a knowledge that was developed in, in the, by Muslim scholars. Okay, so then we talk about so the first his first thing is that you need to go you need to go back to the Greek. Okay, and it's interesting that uh, since medieval Europe has nothing to offer or very little to offer in terms of knowledge, it's uh, it's um, uh, um, it's the modern Europe which goes back to the classical through what has been transferred from the Islam to Europe, well, uh, bypasses as as uh, Huntington does. They bypass the whole Islamic uh, role from the six six hundred to the thirty. And, uh, to the uh, 1200s and 1300s uh, AD, and uh, therefore they, they you jump to, you uh, as if this uh, this uh, period of time did not exist. So you go back to the Greek. Okay, so there's a kind of deliberate uh, jumping over a time which uh, 
uh, which was rich in uh, knowledge production, uh, because you do not want to deal with this, you do not want to get, admit that the Islamic uh, you had that much influence into in your understanding of uh, of learning, because then it would mean that it would mean that you learn from the Muslims more than the Greeks, which is in fact the case. But what they try to promote is that no, we went back to the Greeks and we understood the Greeks more than the Muslims. Okay. Uh, or even the Greek Orthodox, for that matter. So then he talks about the other uh, component of of, uh, of uh, modernization for him is that uh, the the impact, the effect of Catholicism and Protestantism. Protestantism. But his most his focus is more on the Protestant one rather than the Catholic, because the Catholic has has a uh, has this kind of. Uh, 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 tension of dealing with God or the or the earth. Uh, this kind of what is for Caesar is for Caesar, and what is unto God is unto or God. So therefore, the separation between the two worlds, the the hereafter and the obligations towards the, the Creator and the obligations towards the the, the the ruler or the needs of the of the worldly. So Western Christianity, first Catholicism, and then and then Catholicism and Protestantism is historically the single most important characteristic of Western civilization. During most of the first millennium, or indeed, uh, what is now known as the Western civilization was called Western Christendom. Okay. Uh, there existed well-developed sense of uh, community among Western Christian peoples that they were di distinct from the church. Okay, so this kind of uh, uh, is coming from this that you identify yourself by what you, by what you are not. So the Western Christian identified themselves that they, they, by not being Turks, Moors, or Byzantines. Byzantines being uh, Greek Orthodox or, or, or Eastern uh, Church, and others. And it was for God as well as uh, gold that Westerners went out to conquer the world in the 16th century. So it was to try to, to get riches from the colonies as well as to kind of uh, proselytize to change nation, uh, primitive, primitive nations or colonized nations into uh, Christians so that they, they would become a larger people of the, of under the rule of the Pope of Rome. The Reformation and Counter-Reformation and the division of Western Christianity into Protestant, North and Catholic South also distinctive features of Western history. So even the rough, the break, the second break off uh, from within Christianity, from the Catholic to the Protestant, uh, uh, is part of a feature of uh, of uh, modernization. So therefore. The tri what he's saying, what he's implicitly saying, is that you need to break up this uh, control of one version of religion and modify it according to the needs of the people. Okay, which is kind of uh, bring it, uh, diluting what uh, what the uh, uh, faith or uh, or the purpose of religion is uh, in establishing the relationship between human beings and God. And then, therefore, again, with other human beings. But you're not defined by who you're not. You're, what, what also defines you is uh, how your relationship to, you, to, uh, to, the, to your God. So, but if, uh, if your relationship to your God becomes secondary and, and you identify yourself by who you're not, then, uh, then, there's, then the, there's a problem. You know, the, then the, there's a shift in emphasis for the worldly, uh, from the hereafter, and at the beginning of first sessions, we talked about uh, when we talked about the nine levels of analysis: dunya, we ukhrawi, and uh, uh, alami, global, uh, duali, international, and then klimi, uh, regional, and then the state, dawle, uh, majmuat, and then ilakhri. So here, here is where the 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 dunya we and the ukhra we. The dunya takes more dominance over the ukhra, uh, which is what is implied, particularly in the Protestant uh, aspect. Uh, European languages, okay, so therefore the language here, the main language of knowledge was Latin. So if you didn't know Latin in the uh, 
in the Middle Ages, 16th and 17th centuries, uh, you could not know, you could not write, and uh, and therefore most of the uh, uh, thinkers and scholars and discoverers and inventors uh, spoke uh, uh, Latin, which was the language of, of knowledge. Also, okay, so basically it's saying that there's a particular language of knowledge uh, that emerged in the West, and now the language of knowledge, the predominant one, is English, even though it is in decline. The spiritual separation and temporal from uh, and temporal authority. Okay. Separation of spiritual and temporal authority. Spiritual authority meaning what is uh, what is the human being's relationship to God, and uh, the temporal authority is the uh, the relationship to the uh, power structure on Earth. Uh, so, throughout Western history, first the church and in, and then many churches existed apart from the state, God and, and Caesar, uh, church and state. Spiritual authority and temporal authority have been prevailing, uh, a prevailing dualism in Western culture. So, therefore, there's a duality. Uh, there's a dual nature in the Western, West, uh, Western uh, Culture, the tension between uh, the church and the state, uh, God uh, and Caesar, Caesar representing the political structures of the time, uh, spiritual authority and temporal authority. Temporal, which go, which is dominant, the temporal, temporal authority or spiritual authority. Now, the way things have evolved is that it's the temporal authority that, that then uh, becomes more dominant of the spiritual. It's the state that becomes dominant over the church. Caesar becomes dominant over God in this uh, uh, analogy. So in orthodoxy, God and Caesar, so here he kind of uh, gives some statements about where uh, the relation of God and Caesar as he sees it on other religions. In Islam, he said God is Caesar. Uh, okay, if you're if you're Muslim, this is a problem. Uh, you cannot. Uh, there's no way that uh, any human being can be uh, comparable to to the Almighty. Almighty is a creator, and all beings are created, and therefore you do not uh, um, compare or even uh, contrast uh, created with the creator. But the point here is saying is that. Uh, that uh, state and church are one, or politics and uh, spirituality are one, uh, which is, to some extent is uh, uh, is his version of how we see things, but it's more sophisticated than what he portrays. In China and Japan, Caesar is God. Yeah, okay. In Japan, the emperor was God. Okay? So therefore, the emperor of Japan had godly status, uh, according to the belief system in Japan. And uh, as in China, the, I'm not sure that the, the, the heads of the dynasties were claimed to be gods, because there was always, always also this Tao and, and Tao Chi and Confucian version, which goes back to nature rather than God. In Orthodoxy, God is Caesar's junior partner, uh, which is kind of a very... Um, A uh, very skewed way and very, uh, very uh, not academic way or not accurate scientific way of kind of describing things. And the separation and recurring clashes between church and state that typify Western civilization have existed in no other civilization. So, this kind of tension between dunya wal akhri, the here and the hereafter in the Western. Uh, uh, context, they have uh, so, uh, dealt with it in a particular way, that they've separated it and given con more consideration to the um, to the here than the hereafter, and actually made the hereafter part of the here uh, by by elevating the status of human beings to being partners in uh, in the in the creation creation of God, uh, in God's creation and partners of the Almighty. Uh, uh, particularly the Protestant ethic, work ethic, and, and view of how the uh, uh, they view their role, the human being role, and uh, 
freedom and the liberty of the human being, even the spiritual liberty and freedom of the uh, Okay. The, the third one, yeah, the fourth one is mm -hmm. the rule of law. The, the, so, mm -hmm. so why, why is this important? Because the rule of law kind of takes, takes the place of the spiritual dimension mm -hmm. of the, how you, the relationship to God. So the rule of law is the is the alternative, uh, um, or is the substitute for the the the, the ruling of God from God, and therefore the 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 the, the, the law uh, is the spiritual uh, spiritual entity of the society of the modern society. If you are, but it is the one that keeps society functioning in a particular way, in an orderly way, without chaos. Okay, so he says that the rule of law was inherited from the, by the Romans. Medieval thinkers elaborated in the idea of natural law, uh, according to which monarchs were supposed to exercise their power, and common traditional developed uh, in in. Uh, in England. During the phase of absolutism in the 16th and 17th centuries, the rule of law was observed more in the be uh, in the beach uh, than in reality. But the, the idea persisted to, uh, of the subordination of human beings to some external restraint, so that you need to bind or hold uh, human beings accountable to some external confinement, which is the rule of law. Now, this external confinement gradually substitutes the confinement uh, of the relationship uh, 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 as uh, uh, through the through the religion, now, yeah, the laws of, or the canons of the religion and how they kind of or, uh, give order to human beings. Here, uh, you have a human uh, manufactured order of human beings. Okay, which doesn't mean that uh, that uh, if you are Tawhidi or or have, have, uh, believe in God that you uh, no. be lawless. No, you are you are within law, but no, no. but part no, of the, what the, the spirit of the law is is derived from the revelation revelation scriptures that you shall not kill and uh, you shall not steal and uh, lie and. <clears throat> And take care of your parents, and all of those who are in the Ten Commandments. Um, for example, if you, if uh, uh, one of the manifestations of modern society say is that you have the uh, the the homes for the elderly, okay, or the, or or uh, care cent care care centers or care homes for the elderly. Now, if uh, if the, According to one one of uh, one of the ten commandments is that the Akram Okay, so you it is the responsibility of each person to take care of the, their parents. So therefore, if that uh, that should be the norm, and the care homes should be the exception, but they, as uh, 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 well has been uh, kind of uh, exposed. Uh, clearly, in uh, through this pandemic, coronavirus, is that mo many of the deaths have occurred in old people's homes in Italy, Spain, Britain, uh, and uh, and el elsewhere. So, therefore, uh, uh, they become more vulnerable, and uh, therefore, this this kind of care system becomes the responsibility of the state rather than the sole responsibility of. Uh, individuals okay social pluralism okay which means that there is social diversity in the in the western society historically where western society has been highly pluralistic as the deutsch notes uh what is distinctive about west, the west is the rise of persistence of the diverse autonomous groups not based on blood relationships or marriage so therefore, it, uh, he says that Europe, uh, another aspect of modernization is the diversity. But uh, he's not, uh, he's, for some reason, he's not saying that even though the Middle East is also diverse, which, which makes it, uh, or like Terry Rodlafson, saying that the Middle East is very diverse, and therefore, and that's uh, a cause for conflict, 
here he, he says that the diversity, diversity here is a cause for uh, strength. How? Uh, uh, it evolved. For him, he, said, he explains that in the 16th and 17th centuries, these groups initially included monasteries, monastery, monastic orders and guilds, but then expanded to include many areas of European Europe, a variety of other associations and societies. So pluralism uh, was supplemented by a pure class pluralism. And most Western societies included relatively strong autonomous aristocracy and substantial, uh, substantial peasantry. And a small but significant class of merchants and traders. The strength of the feudal aristocracy was particularly significant in, significant in limiting the extent of, the, of which the absolutism was able to take form and do it in most European nations. So the fact that you have an, uh, had an aristocracy meant that the king was not uh, could not ma manifest his abs his absolute power because there was a, a group of people who also kind of supported him, but who also could criticize him uh, or influence him, other than the church. Okay, the church had the moral uh, monopoly. Aristocracy had the money when the king needed, uh, and he needed their support to. Uh, because uh, most of the wealth of the people were of the country or was, was with the aristocracy and if he needed to wage war or needed to uh, have large projects for colonization, he needed to, he needed to the, the, the capital of the aristocracy. So the European pluralism contrasts sharply with the poverty of civil society, the weakness of the aristocracy and the strength of centralized bureaucratic empires, which simultaneously existed in Russia, China, Ottoman lands, and other non-Western societies. So, his point here is that the the, the, the social pluralism had an effect in uh, in in making uh, uh, Europe less centralized as it should as it could have been under the absolute uh, uh, monarchies which means that the, even the king uh, had to uh, consider the views of the feudal aristocracy at the time uh, which uh, uh, which hindered his strength at some point uh, unlike in russia or china or the ottoman empire Russia up until the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, but in 1916 and 15 there were other revolutions in Russia which were which were not the Bolshevik but against the Tsar at the time, particularly in the midst of the World War One and uh, the famine that occurred in, as a result. So uh, representative bodies is another component. Social pluralism all early gave rise to estates, parliaments, and other institutions to represent the interests of the aristocracy, clergy, mer merchants, and groups. So here he's talking about the, the, the development of, of, uh, of institutional bodies within the government or within the political system, which are able to influence the whole political system. So that it is not just a group and their, in their influence, it is how they fit into the whole political system and therefore how they are able to modernize, uh, to influence. And this is the part of the course of, of the evolution of moderni modernization of the institutions uh, into modern democracy. Okay, he, do, he doesn't uh, say, he doesn't, because you've read Philly and you understand, uh, maybe you've gone, you've, uh, We've gone over a bit what it, what this means. Uh, it is more than what the sentence is saying. So there's a lot going into modernization in Europe than just uh, having representative bodies. So with the knowledge that you have about wh what we explained about the, the in Tilly, uh, you have then the the the, knowledge, the reference to critique uh, um, Huntington and some of his claims here which are very, at times, a bit, a bit simplistic. Even when that happened, uh, however, they could, as in France, be resurrected, resurrected uh, to provide a vehicle for expanded political participation. Uh, so no other contemporary civilization has a comparable heritage of representative bodies stretching back uh, for a millennium. So he's talking about 1,000 years of of uh, development of such uh, institutions 
in the polit political systems uh, in a particular continent, which is Europe, and the local level uh, also. Beginning about the 19th century movements uh, for self-government developed in the Italian cities, forcing bishops to uh, local barons and other great nobles to share power with the uh, burghers and uh, uh, in the end often yield them altogether, yield to them altogether and give in, give in to them, give up, give up and give in to them, surrender to them. So representation at the national level was thus supplemented by a measure of autonomy at the local level, not duplicated by other regions in the world. Okay. So he's saying, uh, notice that what he's talking about, whether in representative bodies, he's talking about Europe. Okay. When he's talking about social pluralism, he's also talking about Europe. When, he, when he's talking about the rule of law, he's also talking about Europe. When he's talking about separation of the spiritual and temporal authority, he's talking about Europe. He's, when European languages, he's explicitly saying European languages. Okay? When he's talking about Catholicism and Protestantism, he's talking about uh, Europe. When he's talking about classical legacy, he's talking about how, how Europe went back to the classical legacy. Uh, what is odd? What is strange up till now? And then we talk about individualism. Then is there, is there something strange uh, about what Huntington is, uh, is uh, talking about? I'll ask anybody. Is there something odd in this? Uh, I'm unmuting everyone. Anybody wants to jump in? If you mean, Doctor, uh, that he his uh, ideology focus on the Eurocentric uh, ideology, or something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, he is focusing on 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 Europe. It's Eurocentric. But remember, where is Huntington from? From US. Okay. There's nothing about the United States in all this. Yes, that's right. Okay, so he I, and yes, yet he's claiming to be the one who is uh, who is inheriting all the, what Europe uh, produced. Yet they did nothing of, of, in this is it, or he's not including the United States in this. He's kind of uh, he's uh, what do you say? He is um, normalizing the, the United States and grouping it as it is as it is part of the, the European heritage which goes back centuries. But in effect, the United States is very new. It only became, became, began to evolve in the 70, late 1700s, 1800s. Okay, and as a global power in the after the World War One. So uh, there is nothing here that talks about uh, United States. And yet, what he's proposing in the classical civilization is a role for the United States as the, being the global power and modernizing and re remaking of the order. Okay, so uh, another uh, another uh, component is individualism. Many of the above features of Western civilization contributed to the emergence of a sense of individualism and a tradition of individual rights and liberties unique among civilized societies. So, uh, obviously, the the, the 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 focus of this new culture particular modernization would be the individual uh, emphasis. Okay, that you, you do what is good for you, uh, and then um, everybody else needs to sort out their own uh, uh, interests according to the balance of interests of the many individuals. 
So in one analysis involving, involving so when we go here, uh, he talks about the individualism developed uh, of the tradition of individual rights uh, and liberties unique to, uh, to uh, unique among civilized societies. So individualism developed in the 14th, 15th centuries uh, and acceptance of the right to individual choice, uh, what, what the Deutsch terms as Romeo and Juliet revolution is that uh, our interests are more go over the group interests of whom we belong to. So, uh, so individualism remains the distinguished, uh, distinguishing mark of, West, of the West among 20th century uh, civilizations. In one analysis involving similar uh, samples of 50 countries, the top 20 countries uh, sc scoring highest on the individualism index were all include all of the Western countries except for Portugal and Israel. So it's in interesting that he includes Israel as part of a Western country as well. So here is Israel is neither a beneficiary of uh, seven centuries of, of European evolution. And nor is the United States. So it's interesting that he puts the United States implicitly uh, because he's um, uh, from the United States. And then he adds Israel as, as a modern part of the modern group. So this is a way of how settler colonial uh, systems or states try to uh, assimilate and claim uh, justification by being part of the European uh, Western package of uh, evolution. Even though in the 14th and 15th century, the United States did, was, was not there, and Israel certainly was not there uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries or in the in the 14th and 12th uh, in the medieval time so where so there is kind of this uh, grouping in uh, selectively uh, but here is talking about israel as not being as individualistic as others okay but he's grouping them within the western country okay so the author of another cross-cultural survey of individual, individualism and collectivism similarly highlighted the dominance of individualism um, in the West compared to the prevalence of collectivism elsewhere and concluded that the values are most important in the West at least. Uh, in the West are least important worldwide. So again and again, both Westerners, Westerners and non-Westerners point to the individual as central distinguishing mark of the West. So, uh, when he talks about, so the, the, the above eight points are what he considers as the main uh, the term, uh, the characteristics of uh, Western, West, uh, but also our main, uh, seem to be the main components of Western modernization. So, if any, for according to him, if any, uh, if, uh, if there are several key components of these missing in modernization, it cannot be called modernization. Okay, and he's assuming that only the West has been able to make this revolution in uh, uh, into a new uh, modern revolution into modernity. So, modernity in, in itself is a is a revolutionary component. According to Hunt. So, um, so he says that some obviously, uh, uh, obviously, there there are not uh, okay. The above we is worthwhile. The above list is not meant to be an exhaustive enumeration of the distinctive characteristics of Western civilization, nor is it meant to be meant to imply that those characteristics. Characteristics are always universally present in Western society. Obviously, they, they are not. So he says that not always these are not always uh, existing in Western society. They, the many despots of Western history uh, regularly ignored the rule of law. So those who ignored the, these rules kind of they ended up being in the backward uh, European states. This is what his implication is. So, no, nor is it meant to suggest that none of these characteristics appear in other civilizations. Obviously, they do. The Quran and the Sharia constitute the basic law of Islamic society. Japan and India have a class system paralleling that of the West, and perhaps the result of... Okay. Uh, 
so individually, almost uh, none of these factors were, was unique to the West. The combination of the, them was. So the combination of all the eight factors are, the, are what, according to Huntington, make the West uh, unique. Okay. And uh, this is what gave the West its distinctive, distinctive quality. These concepts, practices, uh, and institutions simply have been more pre prevalent in the West than in other civilizations. They form at the least part the essential continuing core of Western civilization. They are what is, what is Western, but not modern about the West. They are also in large part the factors which enable the West to take the lead in modernizing itself and the world. Okay. So this is his main point. All these eight points are the main features that enable the West to become modernized, to modernize and become dominant part of the world. Uh, before we continue, uh, do you have any questions? And we'll take a break before we go into the responses. Atasem had a note about uh, that there is something strange uh, in that there's a Huntington is an extension of the, of the tradition, uh, but uh, link in the chain in the Orientalist mindset. Can you explain more about this? What, what do you, uh, can you explain more? About what was yes, yeah, that, that was my answer to the question that you asked about um, Huntington being an American citizen and talking about um, uh, the West as a female. Well, 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 he is from the West. He's part of the West by being an American. But but he's talk, he talks about an Orientalist tradition, which is basically European, let's say in a, a European contrast. Uh, but by, by, by derivation, the States is also can, can be considered European. In the political sense of that word. Yes, but what is the uh, what is different different between the settler colonial systems and their 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 modernization and European stages of modernization? Uh, one way to look at it for me would be to um, to look at uh, uh, ur urbanism and, and, and economic development, uh, which was also pushed as an as a colonial argument especially in the Middle East, if you look at North Africa and, and uh, at the British and what they did in Jerusalem or what Zionism did with Tel Aviv. Uh, okay, if we... Uh, if, if we... Uh, within Tilly, if we go back to Tilly, in Tilly, uh, he says uh, the, the, the reaching modern, modern states required state-making and war-making. Now, in Europe, they didn't make wars amongst themselves, particularly in the 18th century, except from the end of Waterloo, particularly in the end of Waterloo up till uh, 1872, 73. Uh, there were no wars in Europe because uh, they were still, the, king, the, the kings were still trying to re recover, from, recover from the impact of the French Revolution, the Republic idea. Okay? Uh, but where were the wars occurring? They were occurring in the colonies, with the colonized. Okay. Now, when you talk about settler colonial systems, if you're talking about the United States, Canada, and uh, New Zealand, uh, Australia, uh, South Africa, and, uh, and, and Rhodesia. Okay. So, the, their, their modernization comes as a, uh, through elimination and through uh, uh, extraction of land or taking over land. Other, other nations and then uh, building the, the resources. So it's a different dynamic. Okay? And uh, yes. when, he, when he includes the United States and Israel as modern states, he kind of, he conveniently merges both to kind of make you as if there's no uh, uh, kind of need to remember all the killings that occurred and massacres and the elimination that occurred in the new world. 
quote unquote places such as Australia, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, South Africa, and uh, um, yeah. So therefore, if you go, if you go, if you analyze the history of settler colonial states, uh, they are not like the European, although they are deriving from the uh, intellectual knowledge of the European. I mean, you didn't have American thinkers that thinking uh, like uh, Locke is, is English. Okay, John Locke is, is British or is from England, and they, and therefore. But the Lockean version of how you build a society is transplanted uh, to the United States. Okay. Now uh, there, uh, they do not need. Uh, they, they do in the settler colonial uh, structures. They do not need to factor in these um, uh, these classes, multiplicity. Okay. So definitely, individualism is very important. Representative bodies, a bit. But uh, I mean, all the representative bodies that had power in settler colonies were the settler colonials themselves. Okay, if you go if you go about social pluralism, no, there, there definitely was not social pluralism. There were settler colonials, and no, and and those who were not. Everybody who was not settler colonial was either was was either enslaved Afro Americans, Chinese, Japanese, or uh, or First Nations. Rule of law, yes. Rule of law, but whose rule of law? Rule of law of the set of colonizers, not of the of the of the, of the states that emerge, trying to emerge from middle middle age uh, absolute monarchies to uh, constitutional uh, monarchies uh, in the eighth, nineteenth century. Separation of of, spirit, of spirituality and temple. Well, this is a done deal. This is a done aspect. In the settler colonial, to some extent, it is the world authority that takes dominance over the spiritual, but the spiritual justifies the world dominance in the settler colonial, because there's a there's a there's a divine mission which they, which they assume to be a partnership with, uh, expanding, uh, spreading uh, Christian Christianity, and uh, bring civilizing the uncivilized. Okay. But for those who, and then European languages, yes, definitely in the set of colony you had European languages, predominantly English, French, Spanish, um, uh, Afrikaner, which is Dutch, uh, and then uh, English, Australia, New Zealand. Capitalism and Protestantism, well, what is most Protestantism, Protestantism which uh, predominated in the set of colony. Well, uh, the Catholicism uh, predominated in Central America, uh, the influence of the Pope. Classical legacy, yes. The settler colonials claim to have a legacy towards the classical, and that's where they derive uh, civilizational legitimacy to, uh, to uh, assume dominance and to assume that they are more advanced and more uh, civilized than primitive or other non-classical based societies. Okay, any other questions or feedback? I'm sorry, Doctor, just I have noticed something strange in Huntington, the old text. Yeah. That is, the, he's trying sometimes to, to misleading the reader, like uh, what he stated in page 72 about Sharia and Quran. Yeah. He, he, maybe Western reader uh, do not or doesn't uh, understand what is Sharia, but he, 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 he he basically he, he is trying to attack Muslim reader as uh, I don't know I, I noticed that he he stated this in uh, in order to attract the reader that is uh, something uh, or attract your attention as a reader about is something interesting here and it directly shifts shifts to uh, another point about the West. Uh, yeah, in, in a way of misleading uh, the reader. Yeah, we talked last time that he talked about uh, any other any other countries that want to or, or groups of people that want to ape the Western, they they can try for some reason. Now the whole use of the term uh, is uh, very revealing about what he thinks about non-Westerners. Okay, so uh, so this is where he's coming from. So when he's trying to kind of uh, include Sharia and uh, 
in his analysis, yes, it's a, uh, you make a good observation. This is his way of trying to capture the reader. Bring him into his, his, uh, his discussion. Now, if you, if you, if you do not know uh, what is behind this, I mean, uh, you can sense what is behind it, but you cannot pinpoint it, okay? This exercise enables you to kind of uh, identify specifically, you say, no, here is he's saying this, here it means this. So when he's trying to bring in the, the gift, you notice he, he, he discredits the Muslims as having any contribution to civilization. Uh, he says that, but even the Muslims benefited from classical. No, the Muslims even advanced what was classical and, and had their own input. And the Europeans took in, benefited from the Islamic input on upon the classical and new discoveries. So, uh, which are still in practice today. Okay. Uh, the, the most simplest one is that you have from one to nine and zero. So, therefore, you can dial. Uh, a, 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 10 digits with the zero, 10, uh, yeah, 10 single digits with the zero, uh, which you cannot do in Roman numerals, okay? Uh, so, um, the point being, this is, yes, this is one of Huntington's tactics to bring in the reader, but also to confuse the reader. If you don't know what, what it means to be uh, uh, of faith, if you're either Greek Orthodox or Islamic, or if any other, if you are not very, very well uh, understanding of what it means to be and how your identity is shaped by that being, you can, uh, you can be, you can slip into what Huntington is saying. Now, why it is, why it is Orientalist is that he, he needs to engage with the one whom he's targeting, the, to be Orientalized. But at the same, why he needs this so that the Orientalized can 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 become defensive and say, "But I am not like what you're describing." Okay, remember that when I, when I drew the diagram that the the one who's Orientalizing has an Im, Im, imaginary image of what the other is. It is not objective analysis of the other. It is his uh, superimposition. Or projection of the negative uh, based on what he is not. Okay, the problem of, of identifying, uh, shaping an identity by what you are and what you are not means that if you can only uh, understand the other but by what they are not of you, you do not understand them individually or kind of objectively or what they are collectively aside from you. Okay. So, in a way, he's trying to bring in, say, if you're, if you're a reader from this region, that the, uh, um, He's trying to say that I know Sharia, and I know Islam, and I know Quran in, in a way, or they have a, a discursive knowledge about them. Uh, to some extent, but he, he would, uh, by, by mentioning them, he, would have, he doesn't necessarily say that I know. He say, I, I, I acknowledge them. Okay, but not. I do not acknowledge them as something of contribution, as a contributing factor. I acknowledge them as something of a degrading. Factor. This is key. Okay. He, as an Orientalist, if he if he makes you believe from this region that you are insufficient, because the West is over sufficient. Okay, or dominant. Therefore, you've got, you've entered the, the Orientalist discourse, and this is how he begins to shape your identity by uh, by by putting you in the dilemma that you are not what he is describing. So, therefore, your 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 discourse uh, project with uh, Huntington is to try to say, but we are not what you're describing. But by once we are in that circle of discussion, we have nothing to contribute to to and bypass, go, go beyond Huntington. We are locked into Huntington's discourse that we, he wants us to prove that we are not what he is describing. And he has a particular path about uh, idea of what, it, what, it, what a good Muslim is for him. A good Muslim is, 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 uh, is the one who uh, is, uh, is Kamalist, which is the responsive. 
So why he why he focuses on responses is that the the good guys, the good people we can deal with in uh, this class of civilization are the ones who are the Kamalists, Kamalist types. You change your whole language. You change you 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 cut off everything you, uh, that has uh, spiritual. Uh, you cut off your whole history. You start a zero, like a settler colony. You start from zero, but except you're not settler colonizing. You are a colonized zeroing. So when he does that, he, he kind of has has uh, uh, erased your history by making you acknowledge that you need to erase your history and start fresh, a new project. Which is also what Teddy Teddy Rodlatson was promoting: is that you need to start. Uh, uh, building a new version of states because you failed to build the conventional states. Yeah. Uh, so when he kind of uses this, this is a way to attract, but to attract into his discussion, uh, his version of discussion. Um, uh, I must admit, when I when I read the article in the 1990s about this uh, clash of civilization, my first uh, reaction was, "But we are not like this." So uh, my instinctive reaction it was that we uh, uh, put me on the defensive, that I need to explain myself that I'm not this. Later, I, later, when you go into Orientalism, you begin to understand that this is their tactic. This is how he kind of uh, dissects you from your, your, the strength of your past and present and who you are, and then introduce him as, as um, uh, with... Uh, persons without context, nor past, nor present, nor heritage, nor society, and you try to, your whole purpose of life in this context is to justify that you are not what he is describing. And you have nothing else to offer except to uh, uh, try to uh, prove that you are nice, according to Huntington. So that you are you are away from the clash of civilization and that you are part of the ones who, who are forming the clash of civilization upon your other... Uh, who are not as uh, uh, aware or educated, uh, quote unquote. Matasem has his hand risen. Yes, Matasem. Uh, Doctor, I have a point with, with respect to modernization and, and what it means and the implications of that. Yeah. Um, um, consider, for instance, what modernization meant or could have meant to a Palestinian addressed by a British colonial officer in the 1920s or 30s. Yes. Um, of course, that was that was hugely different from what what it meant um, to a British citizen in one of the districts of London addressed by a municipality development officer. Yes. All right, and and, and yes. that's what I meant when I when I said modernization um, in the context of settler colonialism or even colonialism in general. And and yes. even Christianity also played plays a different role than uh, than what 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 is generally thought to be. Yeah. Yes. Uh, point taken that the one who is responsible for the for modernization, quote unquote, in the colonies, is the ministry of is the minister of the department of colon or the colonial department. In Britain, you had in the in the in the in the twenties, thirties, you had the colonial department, and there was a minister for the colonial colonial department. Okay, this is different from the for, from the modernization of the, of the ministry of interior. Or minister, minister of industrial affairs, or minister of agricultural uh, affairs in the in the within the political system. So even the modernization within the is a, uh, under the the branch of ministry, the ministry of colonial the colonial ministry, or the minister ministry of the colonies means that whatever modernization is to modernize the 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 home, the country, not the. Uh, not the uh, colon, uh, colonies, except for the purpose of the of the colo, colo, uh, colonial project. If you had, yes, the colonization brought uh, ra railroads and trains, yes, but most of the routes of the railroads and trains were from the resources to the ports, to the seaside. Okay, it wasn't to kind of uh, try to develop the whole a whole uh, area which they colonized. So therefore, those who inherited the, the, this system, they inherited an infrastructure with particular emphasis on extraction, not uh, development. Okay, so uh, this is then becomes a challenge of do you then further the development after 
uh, uh, independence is how do you develop from colonial infrastructure to development infrastructure, which is for the purposes of the people. Okay, any other questions? Any other comments, ideas? Okay, well, I think we take a break until uh, 3 o'clock, uh, 5 past 3, and then we continue with the, with the last section. Okay, we, we, will need, we may need another. Uh, so the, the, the impact of uh, the Western impact on one or more um, of the three ways rejecting both modernization and westernization embracing both or embracing the first and rejecting the second so he has three combinations rejecting both uh, then uh, uh, or embracing both or embracing one and rejecting the other so rejectionism japan followed a substantially rejectionist course from its first contacts with the west in 1542 only limited forms of modernization were permitted, such as the acquisition of firearms and the import of Western culture, including most notably Christianity, uh, uh, which was highly restricted. Westerners were totally expelled in the mid uh, uh, 17th century. Uh, this rejectionist stance came to an end with the forcible opening of, of uh, Japan by Commodore Perry in 1854, and the dramatic efforts to learn more from the West following the Meiji restoration in 1868. Okay, China on the, uh, also uh, rejected uh, uh, modernization or Westernization, uh, although Christian uh, emissaries were also allowed were allowed into China in 1601. They were then effectively excluded in 1722. So China's rejectionist policy was in large part rooted in Chinese image of the itself as middle kingdom uh, of, the, of the Chinese people. So Chinese isolation and like uh, Japanese isolation were brought to an end by Western arms applied to China by Brit uh, to China by British in the Opium War 1839-1848, as in the cases I just during the 19th century. So therefore, uh, uh, this kind of um, here the Opium War is indicative that the wars that the, that the Europeans did uh, were not between uh, 1815 and 1872 in Europe. They were outside. So you had the Opium Wars or wars in, uh, uh, in, in Japan, over Japan. Why? Because these were important. China was important. It was an important market. And Japan was also an important market and uh, uh, route way. In 20th century, uh, in the 20th century, improvements in transportation and communication and, and global interdependence increased tremendously and, and the costs uh, uh, increased tremendously the cost of exclusion. So if you wanted to be part of the evolving uh, uh, world of the 20th century, you couldn't isolate yourself uh, from the world, uh, particularly in terms of trade and, uh, and uh, capital uh, transfers. So except for small isolated rural communities willing to exist in, uh, at a subsistence level, the total rejection of modernization as well as westernization is hardly possible in a world becoming overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly modern and highly inter interconnected. So if you're becoming a world that is modern and interconnected, means that you cannot uh, maintain this kind of, uh, it, com it becomes, uh, expensive and costly to isolate from such a dynamic. So rejection is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is not a worthwhile, uh, according to Huntington, is not a worthwhile uh, route to take. Only the very ex most extreme fundamentalist and Pipes rights concerning Islam reject modernization as well as westernization. They throw television sets into the rivers, ban wrist watches, and reject eternal combustion, uh, internal combustion engine. The 
the practicality for, uh, for of their program severely limits the, the appeal of such groups. However, in, a, in several cases, such as the, the Yen Izala of Quran Sadat's assassins, the Mecca mosque attackers, and some Malaysian uh, uh, Dawah groups, Taqwa or groups, uh, their defeats in violent encounters with the authorities caused them to disappear uh, with few traces. So, those who, uh, for him, Islam uh, rejects modernization and westernization, and they throw television sets and, and, uh, and reject the, the motor cars. Well, um, uh, this, is, this is kind of very stereotypical. And it reflects only a small group of people of the Islamic world. And then most of the Islamic world are consumers of the Western technology. So I mean, this is not quite uh, uh, accurate. Uh, so therefore, but he says that those who rejected modernization are those who, like those of assassinated Sadat and uh, the attackers of uh, Moscow and Mecca all were met with and others were met with violence and they kind of uh, were eliminated. So disappearance of a few chances uh, faces summarizes generally the fate of purely rejectionist policies by the end of the 20th century. Zealots, uh, to use Tombi's term, is, is simply not a viable, uh, zealotry is not a viable option. So for him, uh, those who re rejection is not an option and those who reject, they will be eliminated. Uh, by force, uh, or this is the kind of, uh, the, this is the trajectory, okay? But who is talking about the Islamic rejection? It's Daniel Pipes, somebody from the West talking about the Islam. He hasn't referred to any uh, authorities of knowledge of, from, the, from this region, uh, and no authorities of Islam about what they think. So this is part of uh, and, uh, you could say it's part of an orientalist reference to see that those who speak the same uh, intellectual language, they, they refer to the same group of intellectuals who speak the same intellectual language, rather than uh, diversify the, the source of their uh, propositions. Okay, the second one, the second one is Kamalism. The second possible response to the West in form is uh, Herodianism. Again, he, re he refers to uh, Toynbee. Uh, now, I'm not sure what, whether Toynbee has uh, uh, a very intricate uh, uh, analysis of those who uh, reject westernization and modernization, and whether westernization and modernization are the same. So, but he refers to Toynbee uh, and to embrace both modernization and westernization. So those who embrace both are the Kamalist version. Kamal, you know, Kamalist is the Kamal at the book who uh, reshaped the Ottoman Empire after the First World War and uh, focused on uh, trying to westernize and modernize Turkey uh, so that it would become modern, modern and western uh, by laying blame of the failure of the Ottoman Empire for, the lo for its losses uh, during the First World War for being backward and unable to meet just uh, and compete with the West. So Kamal Atatürk came with uh, uh, came re, came with, with this re uh, designing of the whole culture and society and the character of Turkey. He changed the alphabet from uh, from uh, from Arabic alphabet to Latin al alphabet, uh, and he also uh, uh, imposed uh, secular. Uh, uh, policies and made religious policies and uh, banned the wearing of the turban, the tarbush, and uh, uh, ordered uh, wearing uh, Western uh, clothing. So, uh, uh, as well as then, the, because he was the head of the military as well, so if he was the military that kind of reshaped uh, Turkey from the Ottoman uh, Form to the uh, tur Turkish form of post World War One. So this response is based on the assumption that modernization is desirable and, ne and necessary. 
that the, in the indigenous culture is incompatible with modernization it must be abandoned or abolished. So this is very, so he's not kind of building on indigenous culture or, or, or um, authentic culture. He's kind of totally erasing it and uh, replacing it with something else. And that society must fully westernize in order to fully modernize. So you need to, the way, the key to modernize is westernizing. So if you look like them, you may be, you, you may be actually uh, achieve what they achieve. But it's more than that. Modernization is more than just looking like somebody. So westernize, modernization and westernization reinforce each other and have, uh, and have to go together. Also for him, for uh, Huntington, in order to modernize, you need to you need to westernize, which in, which implicitly includes um, uh, the language and the religion, which we talked about last session. Uh, how we how we uh, the universal civilization, uh, the two key aspects for it are the language and the religion. Okay, and what his religion is being formed, shaping a new uh, universal religion uh, based on self-interest and. Uh, and, uh, and the policies and values of the, of the Davos uh, group of people. So this approach was epitomized in the arguments of some late 19th century Japanese Chinese intellectuals that in order to modernize, the societies should abandon their historic language, languages and adopt English uh, uh, as their national language. So this view, not surprisingly, has been even more popular among Westerners than among non-Western elites. So we're talking about Western, non-Western elites. Its message is, is, to be successful, you must be like us, or uh, our way is the only way. So therefore, the, his uh, slogan is that in order to be successful, you should, be, should uh, imitate them, and then this is the only way. If you imitate them, maybe perhaps you might be able to imitate their heritage of, uh, or the, the trajectory of moving from the Middle Ages to modern modernity, which includes colonialism and making wars and all these aspects of, uh, of uh, uh, suffering towards other people. So the argument is that the religious values, moral assumptions, and social structures of these non-Western societies are at best alien and sometimes hostile to the values and practices of individuals. Industrial, sorry. So hence, economic development will require a radical and destructive remaking of life and society, and often a reinterpretation of the meaning of existence itself. Uh, this is very profound. You need to, uh, for, for Huntington, he's saying that, uh, quoting someone else, is that you're very, why you are here on this earth will have to be questioned if you want to be more And so therefore, if you want to achieve modernization according to Huntington, you, it's an existential uh, uh, shift. It is not a, a, a technical uh, project. Okay, no, it has to do with who you are. You are either a more, a part of modernization and this uh, process, or you are not. And, uh, and therefore, who you are means that who you are not of your society. So therefore, you become, uh, you other. You, you do the us and the othering, now the us is the ones who are not traditional, for example, and not uh, primitive in your own histor historical or cultural context, and you, you, you exemplify or you uh, manifest uh, what you are not in your own society, not what you are in your society. So therefore, it becomes more, it, 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 it's encouraging becoming the, the who, the nots of your society, not the not the, uh, the us's of uh, your society. Okay, in, in, in essence, internalizing the other ring within your society to, for the sake of modernization, according to Huntington. In this sense, you lose your whole identity from the objective sense, and you lose your capability of being authentic, because you have to try to be, be like someone else, which is basically the antithesis of being authentic. And so you need to re reinterpretation of the meaning of existence itself as it has been understood by people who live in these civilization. Pipes makes some point with explicit reference to Islam. So those who have the most work to do on themselves and who they are and why they exist are the Muslims, according to Pipes. Again, Pipes is not a scholar of Islam, 
he's uh, one of the Western uh, studiers of Islam, and he could be uh, not accurate in his assumption, but in his uh, analysis. So we see what he's saying. To escape an uh, enemy, Muslims have but one choice. For modernization requires westernization. Islam does not offer an alternative way to modern. Uh, which is not accurate if you are aware of uh, Islam and, uh, and what it has uh, done or contributed. Uh, there are dark parts of history as well, but they're also uh, uh, contributing factor, uh, aspects of history. This, uh, the, as uh, Christendom also has dark uh, uh, stages and phases and, uh, and some positive ones. Secularism cannot be avoided. Okay, so you need to be uh, separate spirit, uh, church from state. But in our in our uh, in the narrative in the Arabic narrative uh, of the secular, secularism, it's it's uh, din and the and nowhere in the English text does it say separate religion from state. It's separating the institution which represents the religion, which was the church. And we know the history of the church in in, the, in Europe is that the, the Pope had political domination over the states, over the kings. So we're talking about the political aspects of the, not the spiritual aspects. And more modern states in Europe still maintain that the basic uh, cultural identity is one of Christian. Christian. Now in France, it's called Catholicism. Uh, in uh, in uh, Britain, it's the Anglican Church, which is the main reference. Uh, and then in, uh, in other places, uh, you have different other. In Germany, it is Lutheranism. Lutheranism. Martin Luther. Uh, so. Modern science and technology require an absorption of the thought processes which accompany them. Okay. Yes, but that uh, does it mean that Islam has is uh, if you're Muslim you are incapable of modern uh, science and technology uh, absorption? Uh, uh, it's not quite accurate. But uh, for him at the time it seems uh, quite. Uh, uh, he can he can express this, or Huntington seems to be able to convince people about this. So too, with poli political institutions. So not only are the Muslims incapable of modern uh, science and technology, they are incapable of political institutions building, because content must be uh, emulated no less than form. What? What, what does he mean? He means that what you have in substance should have some sort of manifestation in terms of structure. The predominance of Western civilization must be acknowledged so as to be able to learn from it. So therefore, we can only learn from Western uh, reference. Uh, yes, but it's not exclusive. That's not the exclusive uh, form of learning. It is one one reference of learning, but it should not it is not necessarily the monopoly exclusive uh, reference. European languages and Western education institutions cannot be avoided. Yes, granted, and if the latter do encourage free thinking and easy living, only when Muslims explicitly accept the Western model will they be able to in, uh, be in a position to technologize and to then develop. Uh, now this is uh, this is. It's a very serious last sentence. He says, only when Muslims explicitly accept the Western model. So he, the model, Western model being that all the eight characteristics need to be in place in the in the in the in this region. Will they be able to be in a position to technically to technicalize and then to develop? Yani, uh, when you do this, you do not. Uh, uh, there are three st stages still before you are able to modernize, according to Pipes. First, it's something to do with your mind. You need to be able to absorb uh, the Western model, then the and the sciences and the technology. Then you need to be able to uh, be able to transfer that knowledge into something technical that is applicable. 
and only after you have changed your way of uh, your who you are and uh, accepted the western model and uh, be able to expand your brain so that you will be able to be able to be able to be with technology and the educational institutions of, of free thinking he assumes that uh, most islam is not free thinking well it's it's not free thinking to the extent that it, it starts thinking about whether God exists or not, when whether, yes, there's things thinking beyond, below that level, but uh, uh, but not uh, up to that level. Uh, and when, uh, so, only when you, have, when Muslims explicitly accept the Western model, would they be able to position to have the mental capacity to absorb the technology and the modernization to technicalize and then to develop. So this means that when you do these three things, you will be in the beginning path towards trying to become modern. You will not become modern if you do these things. So these are very high. These are very ambitious uh, stages to go through, if uh, uh, for the sake of modernization, to be like the West, as if the Western model is is a model to be. Uh, emulated in all senses. I mean, uh, yes, there are technological advances, there's advances in sciences, uh, but there's also uh, the institutions which are able to invest in such advances. Yes, this is a, this is a, a factor which you cannot uh, deny. But to say that because you have that is means that only uh, any, any knowledge worth of knowledge is, can only be produced in Western institutions and Western according to the Western model, is not uh, accurate. There's a lot of brain drain from the East towards the West in developing what the technologies are, are available. It's also brains, uh, brain drain from this region. Okay, 60 years before these words were written by Mustafa Kamal at the had come to similar conclusions. So, in order to give credit, uh, 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 or uh, not credit, in order to give um, credibility to pipes, Huntington says that uh, this conclusion was made uh, achieved by um, a person, a Muslim from this region called Mustafa Mustafa Atatürk. Yeah, that he 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 reached the conclusion that in order to be modern, he should not be uh, Muslim or try to uh, cut off from being Muslim. He created the new Turkey uh, out of the ruins of the Ottoman Empire and had launched a massive effort to, to both westernize and modernize. In embarking on, on his course of rejecting the, the Islamic past, at the took made Turkey an, a foreign country, a society which, uh, which was Muslim in the religion, heritage, customs and institutions, but with a ruling elite determined to make it modern, western and to, uh, at one uh, with the West. In the late uh, 20th century, several countries are pursuing the Malice option and trying to substitute a Western from non-Western identity. Their efforts are analyzed in chapter six. Okay, so the second one is uh, the Kamali version, which uh, has a pro which in which you need to examine who you are. The, the meaning of your existence itself is is in question, and uh, yes, and this is the way to forward. So, his third uh, uh, res response category of responses to Western modernization is, is rejection, involving the hopeless task of isolating a society from the shrinking modern world. Kemalism involves the different difficult and traumatic task of destroying a culture that has existed for centuries and putting in its place a totally new culture imported from, from another civilization. This is classical uh, orientalism. تبعية الاستشراق بامتياز دون القدرة على الخروج من دائن حلقة الخطاب الاستشراق المستشرق الصفق المستشرق عم بحكي لغة الاستشراقي على نفسه على أمته 
على المجتمع وعلى ثقافته. The third choice is to attempt to combine modernization with the preservation of central values, practices, and institutions of the society's indigenous culture. Okay, if you try to, um, where did it? So, which is reformed? So, he tried to merge and, and combine modernization with the, with, the, with the tradition. What does he think about this? This choice has understandably been the most popular among non Western elites. In China, in the last stages of, China, of the Qing dynasty, uh, the slogan of the uh, 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 Yong, Chinese learning for fundamental principles, Western learning for practical use. In Japan, it was Wakong uh, Yosei, Japanese spirit, to Western technique. Ah, but at least the Japanese maintained their spirit and used the, used the West as a technique, not as a spirit, as a replacing of the spirit. Here in Islam, he's talking about replacing of the spirit with uh, replacing of the Islamic spirit with a Western uh, claim to be spirit, which is essentially a technique, not a spirit. In Egypt in uh, 1830, 1830s, Muhammad Ali attempted to technical, technical modernization without excessive cultural westernization. This effort failed, however, when the British forced him to abandon most of his modernization reforms. Uh, as a result, Ali Mazrui observes Egypt's destiny was not a Japanese state or technical modernization without cultural westernization, nor was it an ethical state of technical modernization through cultural uh, culture western. Westernization in the latter part of the 19th century, how Jamal al-Din of Yavani, Muhammad Abdu, and other reformers attempted the new reconciliation of Islam and modernity, arguing the compatibility of Islam with modern science and the best of Western thought, and providing an Islamic rationale for accepting modern ideas and institutions with where, whether scientific, technological, or political. Constitutionalism and representation, representative government. This was a broad argued reformism tending toward Kemalism, which accepted not only modernity but also some Western institutions. Reformism of this type was, uh, was uh, the dominant response to the West on the part of Muslim elites for 50 years from 1870s to 1920 when it challenged but uh, by the rise of Kemalism and then uh, also a much pure reformism in the shape of fundamentalism. So therefore, uh, according to uh, Huntington, if you try to merge both, maintain some sort of Islamic culture with modernization, it doesn't work. The best option is Kemalism. The rejectionism, Kemalism, and reformism are based on different assumptions as to what is possible and what is desirable. For rejectionism, both modernization and westernization are undesirable, and it is uh, uh, and it is possible to reject both. For Kemalism, both modernization and westernization are de desirable. The latter because of the indispensable uh, to achieve uh, the former. It is, in, it's in this, it is uh, not possible or uh, it is a uh, prerequisite to achieve the former uh, in order to achieve the, the, the latter, and both are possible. For reformism, modern, modernization is desirable and possible without substantial westernization, which is undesirable, according to Anderson. Conflicts thus exist between rejectionism and Kemalism on the desirability of modernization and westernization, and between Kemalism and reformism as to whether modernization can occur with or without westernization. So you have these three, three tensions, which Huntington proposes. You can either reject totally, uh, accept something, but maintain your culture, or accept both. Totally, but it means that you become a new, uh, you become a different person. You have a different existential reference. It is not uh, of your setting, uh, religious or cultural setting. So, and what, how he promotes this is to set up this di diagram. The only way to reach uh, cumulative uh, uh, upward projection from A to B is if you westernize and modernize. If you Westernize, but do not modernize. You reach a peak, but then you go back to E. Okay? 
if you modernize without westernize, you can modernize it, but you, you cannot westernize. So you you remain on a, on a, on the same level. If you westernize without modernization, like you mimic, for example, you cannot modernize. For example, if you're in the, in the of the Gulf region category where you, so you you try to westernize, but you cannot modernize, you have all the all the institute all the facades all, all the, uh, the the physical as, as, uh, attributes of modernization, but you have not modernized. So therefore, if you lose this, you remain on the non-modernization uh, trajectory. Okay? So, uh, you can read the, the, the rest. But then we come to the to the what he's what what he promotes how he ends this chapter. So on page uh, page seventy seven and seventy eight are important uh, for for this understanding this chapter. So the moderate form of Kemalist argument that non Western societies may modernize by Westernizing remains untrue. So. Non-Western societies may modernize by westernizing. Uh, so, Kamal, uh, Kamalist argument is not yet uh, the moderate form of Kamalism, which means to try to merge between the technical advances and uh, maintaining some sort of cultural authenticity. There is no proof of this that this has happened. Okay, uh, whether Singapore represents such a uh, uh, example is uh, uh, is something to discuss. Uh, it built from its uh, traditions uh, to, some, to some extent and maintained a trajectory that was investing in the people, education, so that it would be able to advance and modernize by by uh, by capitalizing on its strategic uh, importance as a as a uh, as a sea transport resting place for the for the sea commercial uh, activity. Now, this commercial activity may be affected by the coronavirus, so you may have, uh, but that's a new development. Okay, the extreme Kamalist argument that non non Western societies must westernize in order to modernize does not stand as a universal proposition. So this is not. He's admitting that this is not popular. It does, however, raise the question, uh, are there some non-Western societies in which the obstacles of the indigenous culture causes the modernization are so great that the culture itself must be substantially replaced by Western culture if modernization is to occur? In theory, this should be more probable with consumatory than, uh, than with uh, instrumental culture. So, if you're a consumer culture, yes, you need to do, totally transform from, a, from being a consumer culture to being a producing culture. Uh, so, instrumental cultures are here, he's defining instrumental cultures. They are characterized by a large sector of intermediate ends, separate from independent of, uh, and independent of ultimate ends. So, these systems innovate easily but spread to spreading the blanket of tradition upon uh, change itself such systems can uh, can innovate without appearing to alter their social institutional fundamentally rather innovation is made to serve in memory in memory reality consumatory systems uh, in the contrast are characterized by a close relationship between inter intermediate and ultimate ends, society. So the state authority and the like are all part of uh, an elaborate, sustained, high solidarity system in which religion is cognitive, is a cognitive guide, uh, as a cognitive guide is uh, pervasive. So here uh, he says that um, in um, Instrumental cultures um, 
they ha they try to maintain this uh, religious attachment. Cognitive guide means that it, it guides your mind. So therefore, for Huntington, this is also a bit revealing. For Huntington, religion is something that controls your mind. Okay, it is not something that evolves you as a as a human spirit or as a human consciousness. For him, that does not exist. He doesn't give the religion that credit. So he's you know, more of a realist. Uh, uh, basic instincts person. He's not one that thinks that religion uh, changes a human being uh, towards the better, or can change a human being towards being more compassionate and more uh, uh, egalitarian and, and fair and just and uh, against injustice. This is not what his, his idea of religion is. His idea of religion is that it's like an ideology. Uh, in fact, when religion is an ideology that kind of uh, constricts your your mental capacity or cognitive abilities, and therefore it, it kind of uh, shapes your the way your way of thinking in a way which is very uh, close close minded. Okay, such systems have been hostile to innovation. Okay, but uh, here yes, you have some societies that have been so. Uh, in, intruded or so tarnished by colonization that they would rather have everything uh, reminding of colonization of, of that uh, influence uh, ejected totally from their from their reference of existence okay uh, so you have this uh, this uh, approach but this approach doesn't mean that you are incapable of science a more, uh, uh, this is a defensive uh, mechanism of being so hostile that you reject. The other advanced, uh, more mature way is that you, yes, you you you, you understand the, the the misgivings and effects of colonialism, but you also see through that uh, violence and try to. Uh, um, Maintain yourself as a human being and maintain your hum humanity. Your reference of humanity is not the colonial colonizer. Your reference of humanity is somewhere else. Uh, Amr al-Mukhtar, uh, the, in, the liberation fi fighter in, in Libya against the, the Italians, uh, when they were able to um, Win a battle over the over the troops. One of the, one of the fighters said, uh, "I'm going to kill them all." He said, uh, "Mokhtar said, no, do not, do not kill them." He said, "He said, but they killed everyone who came when when they came." He said, "Yes, but they they are not your reference. <laughs> your reference of your your moral guidance is something is something else. It's elsewhere. It's not the the colonizer. So therefore." Um, you are not shaped by what you are not, okay? But by the same token, you do not dominate the other by becoming the other, themselves more other than the other. Uh, this kind of, uh, you lose yourself if you, if you want to, become, if you believe that in order to dominate the other, you need to be more other than the other. Okay? So after uses uh, the, these categories to analyze change in African tribes, Eisenbach applies the parallel analysis to Eisenbach is a very uh, well-known um, theoretician about democracies and uh, so if you look him up. He has a lot of books about democracy, in particular in uh, breakaway republics and in the in colonized regions, but he's not uh, yeah, I mean, he's uh, Eurocentric as well. So he's in Western centric. A parallel analysis to the great Asian civilization and comes to a similar conclusion. Internal transformation is greatly facilitated by autonomy of social culture um, and political institutions. For this reason, the more instrumental, okay, he goes about the Japanese and how the Saudi Arabia, he, he mentions them. so. Islamic societies have uh, had difficulty with modernization and Pipe supports his claim that westernization is a prerequisite by pointing to the conflicts between Islam and modernity 
you know, for economic matches such as interest, costing, and inter inter inheritance laws, and female participation in the workforce. So, uh, so all of these, yes, there are um, Islamic uh, reservations about this, but it doesn't mean that uh, that um, Islam doesn't uh, is not for advanced technology, advancement of technology. It doesn't mean that uh, uh, economic mat matters, yes, economic matters, which are not the capitalist oriented, orient, or orient, uh, oriented, because there's another dimension to economics in Islam. There's also the spiritual cleansing of capital through zakat and through uh, benevolence. It is not just uh, uh, getting profit. And there is this, there is this kind of uh, moral balances that if you if you uh, in economic transactions, if you uh, uh, buy something at a cost which is not uh, acceptable by the one who's selling, and yet you are able to impose by other means, by by moral uh, uh, superiority, no, by by kind of ihraj or matlan by some sort of manipulation or exploitation of uh, good relations or something. If you are exploited in, in, uh, in, uh, in deriving your capital, then the sale is not halal. Or there's, uh, there, no, it is, it is halal, well, there's, the sale is a sale, uh, but it means that there's, there's a wrongdoing done in the sale because both parties are not uh, satisfied. Okay, so in, in capital uh, uh, capital or orient, capitalist oriented uh, economics, uh, you do not care about the other side uh, so long as you uh, accumulate as much wealth as possible. Okay, so this is the kind of uh, if you want to comment on this regarding fasting. Yes, fasting. Okay, so fasting means that you there's, a, there's an obligation towards the the. For one month, there's, an, there's a particular deliberate all-day obligation towards the, uh, the creator, which is not the institutionalized uh, uh, temporal authority. No, it's the spiritual authority, which guides, which uh, according to our belief and belief of others, uh, dominates over the temporal uh, uh, authority. And female participation in the workforce, well, this is not accurate. I mean, we have females who are working. But uh, if, uh, what types of workforce and wh whether that's equitable or not, that's another uh, issue altogether. Yet even he, he uh, I mean, he had uh, um, Khadija, I mean, she, she's the first Muslim in, in, in Islam, woman Muslim, and she was a, she was a merchant. So did the Prophet uh, uh, bar her from... from practicing uh, trade after they were married? No. Yet even approvingly, uh, quote, uh, quote Maxime Rodinson, uh, Maxime Rodinson is uh, uh, to the effect that there is nothing to indicate in a compelling uh, uh, way uh, that uh, the Muslim religion prevented the Muslim world from developing along the road of modern capitalism and argues that in most matters uh, other than economic, Islam and modernization do not clash. Pious Muslims can cultivate the sciences. Okay, interesting that uh, Huntington adds this quote. I mean, after he has discredited Islam as having contributed anything to the knowledge of, 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 the, of Europe as a society, he ends with uh, Maxim Robinson saying that pious Muslims can cultivate science, sciences and work efficiently in factories and utilize advanced weapons. So, yes. uh, modernization requires no one political ideology or set of institutions, elections, uh, national boundaries, civic associations, and the other hallmarks of Western life are all uh, are not necessary to economic growth. As a creed, Interesting as a creed, not as a faith. Islam satisfies management consultants as well as peasants. The Sharia has nothing to say about the changes that uh, accompany modernization. Okay, 
such as the shift from agriculture to industry, from countryside to city, from social stability to social influence. Okay. But, but it has something to say about this is the, the qualification. So, uh, nor does it impinge on such uh, matters as mass education, rapid communication, and new forms of transportation or health. Okay. So, it's interesting that Huntington ends with this. Okay, there is hope for Islam. So not, not all Muslims can be, uh, need to be uh, rejectionists, and not all of them need to be Kamalists. But he would prefer that the, uh, Muslims would be Kamalists, okay? So then the last, similarly, uh, the even extreme proponents of anti-Westernism and the, the revitalization of indigenous culture do not hesitate to use modern techniques of email, cassettes, and television promote. Uh, their cause. Modernization, in short, does not necessarily mean westernization. Non-Western societies can modernize and have modernized without abandoning their own, own cultures and adopting hopes and values and practices. The latter, indeed, may not almost may, may be almost impossible. Whatever obstacles non-Westerners Whatever obstacles non-Western cult non cultures support to modernization pale and are, are, are very small compared to those they pose to the westernization. The obstacles in non-Western cultures compared to those uh, for of modernization compared to uh, engaging in a project of westernization, it would be, as Brodel observes, almost like be uh, almost be challenged to think that modernization or the triumph of civilization in the singular would lead to the end of the plurality of history cultures embodied for centuries and the world's greatest civilization. Modernization instead strengthens the culture; those cultures and reduces the relative power of West. It fundamentally weighs the world in becoming more modern and less West. Okay. This is this last paragraph is the paragraph he ends the whole uh, the chapter. And this is essentially his conclusion. Uh, uh, what, uh, what is odd about this? I'm opening it for discussion and for uh, unmuting for anybody who wants to speak. What uh, what is So what is uh, what? Uh, yes, he contradicts himself. I also he, agree with him. I also agree with him because he wrote more than twenty-five pages about how how we must, you know, take the value of Western, the language, and so on, etc. And now he say it doesn't need to okay, do so. Does, but technology and the new civilization and knowledge—it's all about the language in English language. And if we want to let, to know and have that knowledge, we have, to, for example, at least learn that so we can take this knowledge and use it in, in, in our culture, in our society, so we can have uh, civilization or, uh, or modern modernity, trade or something like that, the same, the same okay. word that you said. But, but, but his main argument was not this. But, but this is what I heard, because he keeps... 
this is what I I kind of understand because he keeps saying uh, how the importance of the language, the religion, to create a culture, to create a civilization, modern history, and how we will have it in, in Western and in, in Middle East. Yes, yes, and, okay, yeah. And so on. Yes. I don't know. This is my point of view. Okay, but uh, there is a contradiction. Now, how do you explain this? what is his motive? Is he that stupid that he contradicts himself? I mean, he, he has placed uh, on the previous page the uh, clear graph, showing that the only way to, to, to advance is if you westernize and modernize. Okay? Westernize meaning that you need to re re reshape your own existence. If you're Muslim, you need to be, uh, it's an existential transformation. If you're, if you're non-Western, it's also an existential transformation. Modernization, uh, okay, if you want to modernize, you can modernize without Westernizing, but then this is your, this is your, you, you, you can do this, but then you will end up like this. So, for him, the proof of what he's, what he's saying is in the diagram. What he's saying in the end is that no, everybody can, can advance. Why? Doctor, can I speak? Yeah. I th um, sure for sure he, uh, this uh, contradiction is by purpose. Uh, it's uh, because um, when we need to analyze his uh, text, of course, we need to look for the levels. So he have more than one level. That sometimes he look that he is saying two things which is in contradiction. I think we have to return it uh, to the topic of uh, his book because he t uh, speak about the clash of civilization. So he need to prepare the reader that uh, the war is coming, that the clash is coming. So there is a, um, because he mentioned in the end of the text that the relative power of the West um, instead strengthens those cultures and reduces the relative power of the West. Okay. So yeah. the contradiction, it's about uh, what he ends with. Okay, so... Uh, it's like alarm. He giving the alarm. To whom? To the policy makers yes, yes. of the okay. Davos people. If you, if, you are, if you are a policy maker in the United States or Europe and you read this, okay, this is not, this is not important. Up till here. Yes, that's right. Up till here, this is not important. This is for anybody else who is non-policy maker, who is, uh, who is a general reader in our region. That yes, you have a place in our. We are not uh, that. Uh, we are being kind, even though all the evidence shows that you are incapable of modernization without westernization. We will overlook that, and, and we are kind enough to allow you to be part of our project. What is the project to be part of the process of civilization? Okay. Now, what the, the last line is designed for not the people of the leadership of this region. It's designed for the policymakers. Instead, that. So modernization is your way to inter intervene and reshape the cultures and reduce their power, which also reduces the power of the West. Now, here it can be read by both, as a threat or as a hope. If you're from the non-West, you say that by, by modernizing, you de decrease the power of the West, which is a good uh, uh, enticing uh, uh, objective. In fundamental ways, the world is becoming more modern and less Western. Yes, but uh, but the, the, if modernity if modernity is only built on the eight uh, components which he mentioned before modernization, then westernization is not that relevant for him. The important thing is that all the all the, hold the eight keys all together, eight factors or eight components of modernization. They are the ones who will be powerful. Okay, and this is the project for the West now. Uh, uh, coming back uh, to anybody else have something on the on the chat? Okay, coming back to the title: uh, a clash of civilization and the remaking of the world order. Now, in this chapter, you understand that uh, there are, there's a there's a clash between those who are against modernization and westernization, and those who are modernizing and, Western, and westernizing, and they're mostly from the west. Uh, the making of the world order is the goal or, 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 or the means. If you talk about the clash of civilizations and the remaking of the world order, which is the means and which is the end? This is a question to all. 
the mean uh, is the word order? No. Uh, no. The mean, the mean is the... The wasile to make the mean is the categorization in order to make the to make the rule. So therefore, you need to make the class. If you want to control the ones who are going to reshape the world order, need to and be engaged in class civilization. If you want to be engaged in class civilization, then what do what do you need? You need the pretext or the reason why you're going into such civilization. And this is what Huntington's book is. Huntington is providing the argument for, for non-existence, a clash which does not exist. But he says that this is the future clash. So therefore, he's talking about something, he's building an argument for something that has not happened yet. And therefore, he is promoting a clash. He says that there's going to be a clash of civilization because of all these things. What he's not saying is that it is in the interest of those in power after the collapse of the Soviet Union who have lost their identity because there is no other. It is the fundamental interest of the, of the, the, the powers of who have remained after the, the collapse of the Soviet Union to engage in, uh, to, uh, uh, to create a clash of civilization so that their economic wheels and interests will be able to uh, um, in to intervene into the globe so as to remake the world order. So the end of the remaking the world order and the class of civilization is the mean. And the if you if you have read then it makes sense why Dick you know Dick Cheney from the from the program. He go after he left the Reagan uh, administration. He wor he worked in uh, uh, in Halliburton which is a company which produces arms. And he became the uh, chief executive there. For 10 years, he reshaped the whole uh, uh, company so that it would become the private uh, uh, um, provider of the military equipment and uh, making war to the, to the next, uh, uh, to, to the next uh, Republican uh, uh, leader, uh, President when Bush came in the early 2000s. So in the documentary, the the, one, the head of the, uh, the armed forces in the United States, he said that he heard uh, that these people were talking about in the, in the early 90s about uh, making wars in, in countries. And then they came, re, 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 uh, uh, re, uh, rebooted this kind of uh, promo promotion in 2003 to when Bush came, and uh, in, the, in the 10 years, in the 90s, you had somebody like Dick Cheney uh, capitalizing on the future of creating wars. So therefore, uh, the same uh, kind of military person says that uh, somebody, he got a, a classified document saying that they were go that the United States in 2003 two was going to wage wars in six, five or six countries in five years. Six countries in five years. Yeah? Uh, which eventually will be Iran. Okay, so all the invest capital investment of the powerful people and uh, those who get rich of wars, uh, and using the instruments of governance and the maintaining power, uh, global power, uh, are need uh, the pretext or the excuse, which is not communism. Now it's uh, now it's uh, Islam. Now, for those who are who are reaping. Uh, Huntington at the time, if, you, if this is what you see happening, then, uh, then you, if you are not uh, um, confident enough, you'd say, okay, where's my role in, in this uh, new future world is to be the good uh, Islamic modernizer here. Even though most of the evidence says, suggests that you need to transform your whole being and become a different person altogether uh, if you want to survive this. Okay. So actually, he's not talking about something that is happening at the time. He's talking. He's he's making the argument for something that is going to happen. And essentially, not, nobody predicts the future, unless the future is already being planned. So therefore, at his time, his pro, his proposition was that the the United States should lead the West in preparing for wars which will 
be done under a clash of civilizations against the Muslims primarily under, uh, the, for the main purpose of controlling the resources of the world and maintaining dominant culture, uh, dominancy and uh, uh, eradicating other cultures. But the, 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 the public uh, uh, media uh, excuses would be that Muslims are, are terrorists and are incapable of understanding the level of civil, civilization or advancement we Westerners have achieved. And therefore, we are an existential problem to anything that is modernizing or uh, essentially Western. So, this is this is a type of literature which which is not uh, based on academic uh, uh, vigorous analysis. It is push, uh, bringing together uh, from here and there. But what is being promoted is not. Uh, he used diagrams, he used statistics, he used some quotes, but most of, most of his references are not from the regions of the world he is talking about. It's, a, it's from a, a particular think uh, group. And uh, so therefore his book is mostly to promote uh, uh, and the blueprint of how the, those in the West should uh, uh, conduct themselves in uh, making the remaking the world order according to the new criteria. And essentially so that the best identities after being unable to other, other having a, another Soviet Union other, need now the other or, or the Muslim other. Okay, so that they mean so that they salvage their identity of othering. The binary thing, binary discourse of uh, Orientalism. Okay, any we've, we've finished. Any questions? Any thoughts? Doctor, I have read uh, another quotation from somewhere. I think to, uh, from the chapter two. If I can share it with you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he said uh, the West won the world not uh, or, uh, not by the superiority of its ideas or values. Or religion, but rather by its superiority in applying uh, organized violence. West, West, Westerners often forgot this fact. Non-Westerners never do. Uh, yeah, uh, the the industry of organ the industry of using war. We hear war making becomes a an, it's an industry. And uh, in our regions, war making is not an industry. Uh, in general, it is not an institution. It's either, uh, or rarely is it an institution. When it becomes an institution with which feeds on the previous experiences of war and uh, in fighting and uh, defending against colonization, and how you do that, and and as a body of knowledge, as a discipline of, of uh, knowledge, or as a field of knowledge. Uh, that is when you are able to engage uh, and maybe uh, uh, have some achievements in this sort of clash. Yeah, but there, I, the the idea here is that yes, uh, he is interested. Uh, hunting thing is in, is interested in the in the well, one percent, the fifty million uh, powerful people of the world, the, the one percent of the globe, who will control the whole world, the Davos culture people. Okay, and he, these are the one. He's interested in the interests of the one percent to uh, control the whole globe. Okay, now how? How this is the basic uh, interest. Now, how how he needs to repackage this? He cannot say that we are killing uh, people in other regions just because we want to get rich. That that, that doesn't uh, work with uh, with uh, people. Okay, unless you're of the people who are getting rich, uh, such as the big companies, uh, Boeing or Halliburton or Blackwater, which then had to re rename itself because it, got, uh, it became, became a scandal. Uh, but yes, so uh, not the point is uh, in an Orientalist text, there's an, there's uh, another uh, motive. Sometimes it, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, you can read through the lines. Uh, sometimes the title says it all. 
clash of civilization and the remaking of world order. So if you uh, if you read it uh, from after after analyzing the, this chapter, you understand that remaking the world order is objective. Why? So as to maintain power of the of the United States. And the clash of civilization is the, is the excuse. But if you need, if it's a, if it's an excuse, you need to create this excuse. And if and if there is a clash of civilization when there is not a clash of civilization at the time, it means that somebody is planning for a clash of civilization. This is how politics is. When somebody says in politics, somebody that has a plan or says that in a few years uh, this is going to happen, it is not it is not uh, an inter an assessment of the interaction interaction of phenomena. No, there is vested interest in in shaping the region in a particular way. Terry Lord Larson, when he's speaking in two thousand and 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 uh, eight or eleven. No, 2008, when he's, when he's speaking to, uh, to, the, to the forum, to the conference in Saudi Arabia, yeah, he is talking about he, he, what he says actually is now in, in practice. You see it in the region. This is what, what is being designed. Somebody is designing uh, the, the future of, of, of places and people. Okay? Now, in order to get people uh, on that... Uh, to support such a project, that they need to, they need to make it, uh, they need to create the the excuse, and the excuse is this, even though there is not. And therefore, uh, the one who is reading, if you are from this region, you're you're left with uh, the impression that okay, uh, the best way is to be one of the good one who is not uh, clashing. So then you need to show that you are not a clasher, okay? Uh, but then you fall into the Orientalist discourse that you have to prove yourself that you are not that you are non-violent. You are a non-violent human being, okay? Uh, which uh, which is uh, which is the trick of Orientalism? Orientalist discourse is that it tries to make the Orientalized uh, put the Orientalized in the defensive. To defend that he is not what the Oriental is, to, is, is describing him, and therefore distracts him from actually breaking away from the whole this, the Orientalist uh, uh, um, uh, constraint. Okay. Any questions, Doctor? I need just to add uh, a comment. Yes. Uh, just uh, about uh, what Mohammed mentioned and you, uh, I think um, if we we need uh, when we read the text to just think how the writer how uh, the writer uh, especially is thinking, uh, like how Huntington is thinking, because he I don't think he is care about the modernization and for other uh, nations or civilizations to be a Western. This is not his interest. His interest. To more uh, to get benefit for the individualism interests, which is to generate more profit by selling the weapons and this based on the video that you sent us. So he just giving approves that a clash is coming to happen. More than he uh, he is interested the others to be a western. He even he I don't think he need the others to be a westernized. He need yes, them yes, to be yes, the same yes. as they are. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is a good point. He, he's he's not in, even if you want if you if you're from if you if you are from this region you want to be westernized or modernized. He says good luck. Uh, essentially, he's saying good luck. You can try, but good luck. Okay. So he also he already this is the, in, in the analysis he's dismissing even the possibility of even if you try you won't you won't you won't reach. It. Okay. So that which is defeating the purpose. Okay. Uh, essentially, which is why he needs at the end of the chapter to say that no, uh, he, in order to not be so diff so exclusive, uh, he says that no, uh, some some of you can make it, even though he, his analysis says that no, even if you try, you won't. Okay, so he's not interested in westernization nor modernization. He's interested, yes, in the in the interest of, of maintaining dominance of this one percent of, of whom he represents, and he th he is part of. He is the thinker of the one percent. 
and his interest is that the one percent in the in the dominant uh, global power, uh, how are they able to maintain their control over changing world? So the aspect they know who, they know who, who they are. They are individuals. They are they are built on greed. Uh, there is no moral standing. All that all the identity thing or the modernizing or the westernizing or the the scientific, they, he is not concerned, but these are all excuses for the civilian's argument at this point that why is there going to be a clash? There's going to be a clash between those who can understand what modernization is and those who cannot. And those who cannot understand modernization, he says, are incapable of understanding because they're Muslim. Their mind is built not to understand what modernization is. This is what his claim is. But he, at the end, he says that, uh, no, you have a chance. But, but he's kind of being sarcastic. He's saying that you can try, yes, but you won't. According to our assessments, you won't. And even if you try, we won't let you. Because we will, we will need to inter, uh, interfere so much into you, in, in who you are that you tran we transform who you are so that you are not uh, a potential um, uh, challenger to our world order. Given that the largest population of the world, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that um, uh, Islam at the, in the 90s was increasing several, uh, several percentage points um, compared to others when we talk about that. So he, and why not just because, I mean, if we were, if we were Buddhist in this region, because the region is so rich, Strategically, it would be, it would be against Buddhism, not Islam. So Islam is very convenient because then it has this, it feeds into this uh, European crusade and mentality, Orientalist mentality, and, and mid uh, mid Middle Ages uh, through the the uh, Enlightenment and through then the the Industrial Revolution. Okay. So the one who controls the world needs to control this region and the, and the regions which have the most resources, which happen to be the regions with, more, with, most, with most Muslims or Eastern culture, meaning that even Orthodox are targets or Orthodox Christians are targets in this, if they're here in this, in this region. Um, yes, so this is, uh, this is if anything, Somebody uh, in the chat, somebody mentioned about Edward. I didn't understand this. No, talks about in the end, uh, the end is in order, as Edward described him as a crisis manager. Oh, yeah. Well, no, he's making a crisis and then becoming the manager of the crisis. The here is not a crisis manager. He's making a crisis, creating a crisis, so that he can redesign the, the redesign of politics. There was one commentator in the in the documentary talking about the the, the, the Congress. I think that there there is political science which is abstract, and then there is political design which is real. So he is doing political de designing. But it's the designing of a, of a future of a region and designing the and the promoting a particular design of how to control this region and to maintain power over the world. Okay. Uh, any other questions? So on, uh, you you are to submit on on Wednesday, yes. Doctor, I have a question. Yes. Um, do you think that the uh, uh, United States will use the same approach that used like hunting was like they will use thinkers to promote for their policy and their view of the world? Like right now? Right now, hunting them is dead. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but but, uh, but he was his ideas were very living in Bush uh, uh, after 9/11. Yes, Huntington uh, towards the end of the 90s was uh, not uh, was uh, kind of um, it didn't fit. After 9/11, Huntington fits. Yeah. 
but but Huntington fits because you had the people who read Huntington when they when this first came out in 1992, 93. I don't know how people. Okay. Like Dick Cheney, Rumsfeld, and all these people who then then assumed power when Bush came to power. They were the ones who shaped uh, U.S. foreign policy. We call the neocons, neoconservatives, and this new. Uh, uh, the, the new century project of the Conservative Party and the Tea Party group, which are ultra conservative. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So yes. And if you go to Huntington, he has other publications. You will be interested to know that one of his first publications wasn't about classes, about civilizations or politics. Okay. Okay. Uh, I will. I will just uh, show you something. Um, just two minutes. Huntington, his first book was uh, was about uh, military. I will show you the book. So he's a military person. His his background is military Cold War Cold War strategy. Yeah, and how you make military society, how you shape the soldier in Western democracies and and all that. So in the fifties. His main concern was building militaries against the uh, against the communism. Okay. Then in the 90s he proposed the clash of civilization, which is for, which is feed into uh, his uh, his uh, uh, field of interest. I'll just show you one thing. Um, Okay, I'm sharing this uh, this screen. If you're still with me, um, share. Yeah. Okay. Huntington's first book was about civil-military relations, the soldier and the state. How you make the soldier and the relationship of the military as an organization with the state. And this was uh, this was his, his publication is in the in, in the fifties. So his main uh, field of study is, is the military and uh, how you advance the role of the military. And he's talking about several um, uh, several types of military political structures and where the military and the role of the U.S. military comes and how the, there's a separate sev separate concept for the for profession of of, um, of being a military. Okay. Person. Uh, it is not just uh, having uh, having the arms. There's a, a whole uh, body of knowledge and reshaping of who you are when you become a military professional. Okay, the standards and skills and whatnot. If you are interested, but this is this is Samuel P. Huntington. This is his uh, his uh, reference point. So when he comes in the 90s to talk about civilizations, of course he wants more wars. Of course. Oh, is he always looking for like a new enemy? The United States. I don't get it. Uh, no, but 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 you need to understand that uh, his his reference of, uh, uh, of the world order, world view, is the the realist. Okay. Uh, so you do not his his purpose is not to find new enemies. Okay. His per he he believes that the world is full of enemies anyway. Well, and human nature is 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 very uh, is uh, militaristic. Why? Because everybody wants to their own self-interest, greed. So therefore, if everybody's fighting for their interest, there's going to be clashes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so he's he's from the body of the realists who believe, like Hobbes, that uh, the world is uh, is chaos, and therefore, in order to organize this chaos, sometimes you need to make chaos by war so that you organ reorganize the whole. Well, so that it's not chaotic to you, but it's chaotic to those who are living the chaos. Okay. I have another question. You can yes. Ask. Yes. Um, 
um, because we didn't read the whole book, and I can see that I can like make a whole opinion about the book from this chapter. But I have a question that that he ignores the by like the the voice is breaking, so speak slowly. Uh, I can see that he ignores the rule of the state. In yeah. the but I couldn't, like, I couldn't find a question, an answer for it because we didn't read the whole chapter. But I want to ask, does he keep doing, doing this in the whole book? Oh, no, you need, to, you need to look at the whole book, where he's going with it. Okay, so he doesn't... Okay. He's, uh, uh, in this chapter, this chapter is a good chapter to examine because you do not know where he's going. Okay. Okay, which is perfect because you should not know where he's going. You should uh, you should try to analyze where he's going, even though you've heard about him and you know where he what he's saying. But you need to analyze where 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 he is. If you understand this chapter, you understand the rest of the book. Okay. Uh, where okay. he's going with the rest of the book. Okay, because you know that uh, he he say he's he's claiming things. He's giving false hopes to to peoples of other regions of societies. And he's saying that you can try to get better, but you won't get better. And we will come and and make wars in your your, your areas, and we will we will say that we are doing this because you cannot, you are either jealous of us, or you cannot understand us. So the world has no room for people who do not do not does not do not understand modernization, especially if you're on the wealthiest uh, regions in the world. Okay. 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 Thank you, Doctor. Okay. No problem. Any other questions? Okay, so then uh, um, we might have a session after the Eid, uh, maybe uh, we'll see when we're, once I know when, when the uh, university break is, we will arrange a time, it will be either Wednesday uh, or no, Wednesday or Thursday. But for most likely Wednesday, if, if it's uh, if it's the if the Eid is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, then Wednesday we will do uh, a session, uh, inshallah, so that we go over some um, uh, what is it, the global studies uh, approaches, okay? And inshallah, before the Eid, I will send you the exam questions so you can have time to work. Okay, but uh, you you I expect you to submit the papers on Wednesday by by Wednesday morning. And uh, all, all the best. Uh, and uh, stay safe and stay in